Good evening. I'm so excited tonight. Guess why? Because we had Bible study on another Thursday. A Thursday that we was not expecting, but God laid on my heart to teach you guys about fasting because he laid on my heart for us to fast as a ministry for seven days, for seven hours. And because of that, I wanted to share with you what does it mean to fast. Good evening, good evening, good evening. We are about to learn. I hope y'all got your pencils, your pens. I hope y'all have your Bibles. I hope y'all have a notepad, maybe a journal. I hope you have your ear pods in. I hope you'll be able to listen while you're at work. We're going to be together tonight for an hour and a half. We normally are together for an hour, but I have so much information that's very important that I want you to learn. So I pray that tonight you will have a better understanding about fasting. I pray that you have a better understanding about prayer, and I pray that you have a better understanding about how to connect with Christ. Because a lot of us need so much in this hour, but a lot of us don't know what it takes to get to hear God's voice and to be able to really receive. So I ask you tonight to get your Bibles with you, get your word, get your, um, a tablet, get a pen, share this live with somebody, call somebody real quick and let them know we're going to learn about fasting and praying and we're going to just get in God's presence. I am going to be teaching a lot tonight. But I'm excited because I want you all to fast with me. I want you to fast with SGS Ministry. If you never fasted with SGS Ministry before, it's a corporate anointing that everybody's doing it on the same accord. Everybody's praying on the same accord. We have the same prayers that we're praying, the um, same scriptures that we'll be reading. So I really want you to be able to really be able to endow it in your spirit and be able to receive everything for these next seven days, starting on May 24th to May 31st. We will be fasting and we will be turning down our plate. So some of you guys have never fasted before, and that's okay. You're going to learn why, what's the purpose, why do you need to repent, why do you need to get into God's face, why do you need to hear the voice of God. And this is a good time to learn because we're all home, we're all quarantined. So this is a good time to be able to listen. So I bless y'all. I thank y'all so much for being on. I really, really appreciate you for being consistent. I thank you so much for just taking out the time to listen to me. Even if you can't stay the whole hour and a half, um, I will be uploading this video on YouTube. And it will be on there within an hour or so after um, I have this live done. So it's okay if you can't stay on. I understand because people have um, things to do. But if you don't stay, you always have another opportunity. So I love y'all. I'm excited. And I ask y'all to pray right now. Just take a moment to pray and ask God to take hold of the internet, take hold of my phone, take hold of the interception that our lives been failing the last couple weeks. And I don't know what it is, but I know that this word is necessary. So if y'all could just, just say a quick prayer um, to ask God to allow us to be able to get through this entire live without it going out. God, I bless you. Hey, Sadia, I did leave you a message. Um, let us pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, we bless your name. God, I just love you so much. I just thank you so much for opportunities to be able to teach your word. God, I'm nothing without you. Father, I ask you to decrease me and increase you. Father, I ask you to use me until you use me up. God, let me be your vessel tonight, God. Father, I ask you to consecrate our oil, God. Father, that it will be anointed oil, that when we use it, God, that you will be a part of it, God, that the Holy Spirit will just endow on us and we will feel your presence. God, I ask you to touch the words that will come out of my mouth, that my lips are lips of clay. God, I ask you, whatever I say, let it permeate their hearts. Let it permeate their souls. Let it touch their ears that they might be able to hear. Father, touch their hearts that they might be able to receive. Father, something that they did not know about fasting, God. Father, I ask you that all those that are on this live, that they have the commitment level to be able to do it on Sunday, that they will be able to push their way through, even if they can't do the full fast with no water or no, or no food. Father, I ask you to allow them to be able to get to half of it, to be able to go through because they knew they were doing it in your name. So, Father, I thank you, God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm excited. Hey, y'all. So we are ready to learn tonight about fasting. I thank y'all for coming on with me this evening. I know y'all probably was trying to hurry up and cook and eat so y'all can get done so y'all can sit down with me. But you can eat while 
Um, I'm teaching because I can't see you. <laughs> Amen. So we're going to start off with Joshua. I want to start off with Joshua because um, at that time they were consecrating before they went into the promised land. And that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be consecrating ourselves. We're going to be consecrating our body. And we're going to consecrate the oil as well. But um, in this time, before they entered the promised land, the Israelites were to perform a consecration, which was a purification ceremony. That's what we're going to be doing for these next seven days. We're going to be purifying our souls. We're going to be purifying our hearts. We're going to cleanse our hearts and our minds and the things that have been distracting us from God. That's our job now is to purify, to have a purifying ceremony. Don't nobody got to know about your ceremony, only you and God. Amen. It says that this was often done before making a sacrifice. So you purify and consecrate yourself before making a sacrifice. Fasting and praying is a sacrifice. It is not easy. It is a sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So we're being obedient right now to the voice of God through me because God told me that SGS ministry should fast together. So we're making a sacrifice. It says in the, um, in the word, before witnessing a great act of God, we should purify ourselves. God's law stated that a person could become unclean for many reasons. In the Old Testament, they became unclean for eating certain foods, giving birth, or dealing with diseases. Or touching a dead person. But God used these various outward signs of uncleanliness to illustrate a person's inward uncleanliness that comes as a result of sin. The consecration ceremony pictured the importance of approaching God with a pure heart. That's what we have to do tonight. We have to come to God with a pure heart. You have a couple more days to ask God to purify your heart. You have a couple more days to say, how can I consecrate? What do I have to do to lay down some things? That's our job tonight. So that, that's why I did it on Thursday. So you have Friday, Saturday, before Sunday, before we begin. So like the Israelites, we need God's forgiveness before we approach him. So we can't approach God just like, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I need your help. You have to approach him with a pure heart. Amen. So Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Somebody say amen. God is about to do something amazing among us. In this ministry, God is about to do something amazing. He's already showing himself strong, but he's going to do something amazing in you. Because he said, consecrate yourself. That means the individual, one by one. We all ain't going to get the same collective blessing, but we will because we're doing it in a corporate anointing, because we're doing a corporate fast. So what I want you to know is, he said, consecrate yourself. For the Lord, tomorrow will do amazing things. Our tomorrow is Sunday. So you have Friday and Saturday to pray and ask God, what is it that we need? This is what I need you to do. I need you to do over the next two days is I need you to write a list of everything that you need from God in this hour before we get back to our normalcy, before they open up the world, before they allow us to go back to work, before they allow us to do the things that we used to do. I need you to write a list and make it plain and specific. And when you do that, ask God to, when I need these things, but I want you to make me, give me a pure heart, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Amen. So I have taken some time, and I, I studied fasting for a long time because um, it just always intrigued me. However, we I fast a lot, and I got a lot of inserts from a lot of different books about fasting. So I'm going to read a lot of different inserts from other books that I got information from. So if you can write the scriptures down, you don't have to um, go to them if you can't because I have a lot. But I want you to take the time to actually write them down so you can go to them at, a different, at another time if you can. So my notes say there are as many... As 40 or 50 million Christians in the United States who have professed a born-again experience. Yet, as we look at our, our nation, the salt is losing its savor. Let's go to Matthew 5, 13. What does it mean by our salt is losing its savor? You know the um, what salt does. What does salt do when we put it on food? It enhances. Salt purifies. Salt makes a difference in any type of food that you use. Amen. So when you go into a room or into an atmosphere and you are not salty, you won't change the atmosphere. Us as believers should be able to shift the atmosphere. We should be able to make a difference when we enter into darkness because of our light, because of our salt. We should be able to purify the situation. We should be able to cleanse the situation. You know that when people have wounds, they use salt to clean the wound. Well, we can be a cleansing agent. Amen. It says in the Bible in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything. We do not want to lose our savor. We do not want to lose our value. We do not want to lose our flavor. We do not want to lose our per, um, per, preservatives. You know, salt is a preservative. You know, we preserve situations. Do you know that? That that's what our job is to preserve a situation. We are du durability. Salt is used for durability for certain, for certain things. So in his cleansiness, it says it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. We don't want to be thrown out of the kingdom because we lost our savor. Amen. It says, I hear of Christians who are living defeated lives, who seem to have little spiritual power. When you are salty, you have power. You can shift the atmosphere immediately when you do anything. When you go into a situation, when you're speaking a word over something, you can shift the atmosphere because of your saltiness. Amen. Because that it gives you power. When Jesus returned from the Mount of Transfiguration, a father approached the Lord concerning his son. The young boy was a lunatic and on many occasions had harmed himself. Let's go to Matthew 17, verse 16 to 21. Matthew 17, 16 to 21. Now, this is where he was talking to his disciples about fasting. And it says, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. Now he's talking to his disciples. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. A lot of us have so little faith that we don't think that we can drive out demons out of our own house, out of our own children, out of our own loved ones, out of our job. We have that kind of power. And God said to his disciples, how long do I have to stay with you for you to believe that you have the power? Well, they wasn't going to get the power until he left, but he knew his time was coming near. Then it says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You got to know that that's amazing because just a little bit of faith will allow you to say, move, devil, move for your, for your relationships, for your job, for people antagonizing you on your job. You can say, move, and it will happen. Amen. And that's because of a little small grain of mustard seed sized faith. In, in the King James Version, it then goes on to say, but this kind does not go out except by fasting and praying. You cannot sometimes... Um, remove demons or demonic spirits out of your children or out of your loved ones or out of situations if you do not have a fasting spirit, if you have not fasted, if you have not prayed. Sometimes it takes fasting to get things done. And you can just say, I've been praying, I've been praying, I've been asking God to help me, but why am I not being able to receive? It's because fasting is necessary in some situations. So let's go on. Jesus answered his disciples because of your unbelief. Then it goes on to say the final words of Jesus regarding his disciples helplessness are applicable to the 21st century Christians. This kind does not out, go out, but by fasting and praying, prayer and fasting initiate spiritual power. If you want spiritual power, now you already have power through the Holy Spirit, but if you want more power, if you want that spiritual power to be able to lay hands on the sick and they are healed, you need to fast and pray. So how do you fast? Fasting is not merely abstaining from food. Mainly, many people do it without food for health reasons. Sometimes they tell us to fast because we have to um, take a test at, the, at Crozier or something like that. And they say you can't eat for 12 hours. That's fasting. But they are not biblically fasting. That's not a, a, a fast that's biblical. That's just a fast for a situation or a moment. That's not biblical fasting. Also, many people miss a meal because they are just too busy, but that is not fasting as well. Fasting involves prayer, repentance, and searching one's heart. Fasting involves the right reasons and biblical methods. You have to have the right reason. 
I know that I asked you to fast, but you have to ask God, is it my time to fast? Is it meant for me to fast at this moment with SGS and ministry? If it's not, it's okay. But you have to have the right reason when you do it. Amen. The Old Testament describes fasting as afflicting one's soul. Let's go to Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 14. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 14. And it says, shout it out loud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the, the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and have not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. A lot of people have fasted and they still do what they want. They say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. But you're still doing as you please. This is why he don't notice your fasting. And exploit all your workers. It says in verse 4, your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. And in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? He's saying that you can't fast for one thing today and then you snap and curse at somebody out the next day. Or you be fighting and arguing. You can't fast and ask God to do something for you and then in the next breath you're doing something different. You can't do that. You have to really purify yourself. You have to consecrate yourself totally. It then goes on to say, verse 5, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? It is only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes. Now, in those times, they fasted one day a year for the day of atonement. Amen. So that's what he's saying about the one, they fasted for one day. Then it goes on to say, is this what a fast, is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fast that I have chosen? Now, this is the kind of fast that the Lord has chosen for the Israelites and for us. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. It is not to share your food with the hungry. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? He's saying we're supposed to be sharing our food with the hungry. That's a fast. That's even fasting. To share your food with people that are doing worse than you. And to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked, to clothe them. That's even part of a fast. He says, and not to turn away from their own flesh or blood. Verse 8, then your lights will break forth like dawn. He says, if you do those things, if you feed the hungry, if you clothe the naked, then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. If you're looking for healing in any situation in your body, if you fast with a pure heart, your healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness will go before you. It then goes on to say, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then the glory of the Lord will be behind you. It will go before you. It will be on the side of you. It will cover you like a fence. Amen. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. You got to cry out, but you got to do it with a pure heart. And he will say, here I am. He will not leave you. Amen. It then goes on to say, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Then the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden. This is powerful because he's letting us know what will happen if you do your fast perfectly. He says, like a spring whose water never fail. Verse 12, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairers of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is our Sunday, the day that we serve God. And do, from doing as you please on my holy day, he even goes on to tell you that stop doing what you please on Sunday. If you call the Sabbath a delight, 
if we delight on Sundays, if we give God our everything on a Sunday, he says in the Lord's holy day, honorable. And if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find joy in the Lord. It says, then you will find joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now he's speaking to Isaiah and Isaiah gave them the word. This is what happens when you really, truly are sincere about fasting. There must be a spiritual purpose to fasting. If it is to be a testimony to God. So what is your spiritual purpose? What do you need God to do in your life? How do you need him to change your heart? Because a lot of us don't have the great right heart practice, but he can do that. All you got to do is just ask him. It ain't no cartwheels, it ain't no flips, it ain't no dips. Just ask him with a sincere heart. Lord, I need a new heart. I need a change. I need you to do something different in me. And it, just like that, he would change your heart just like that. I'm no respecter person, but he do it for me all the time. Fasting shows the sincerity of our prayers. When we pray, God answers our prayers with regard to our sincerity of our faith. Amen. Let's go to Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask, somebody say whatever, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, somebody say believe, that you have received it. And it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, I'm going to say that again. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you for your sins. Now he's letting us know if you ask whatever, you can have it, but you have to then forgive so he can forgive you too. Amen. Why? Because fasting is a completely different experience. When you are fasting, it is for a spiritual purpose, either asking God to provide for a certain need, to give you guidance regarding a certain need, to, or to help, other, help your ministry through a crisis period, or to help your life through a crisis period. When you commit to yourself to not eating anything for one day, now, I'm asking y'all to do it for seven days, but if you commit yourself to not eating anything for one day and you're doing it to God as a testimony to God, he will allow you to receive anything because it is a testimony to your belief and your faith. But Satan also knows your commitment. Somebody say Satan knows. He attacks you with all the powers in hell. He, he attacks you with the desire to eat. He attacks you with, with commercials on TV. He attacks you and it becomes overwhelming. But it is not because you are hungry. It is because Satan wants you to break your commitment. Amen. During a fast, every urge for food is intensified. I'm telling y'all, it's intensified. He wants to laugh in your face. But with divine help. You have to have divine help. What is divine help? Help from God. He's divine. He's divinity. He's divine. With divine help, he will allow you to keep your commitment because of your faith and your belief. So how do you get ready to fast? You got to first determine the length of your fast. Do not enter a fast without setting a time limit. Now, I gave y'all a time limit. I told y'all we want to fast with SGS ministry as a corporate fast for seven days for seven hours. However, if you ask God, how long do I need to fast? And it's different than SGS ministry. You do that. If he say three days, if he say one day, if he say an hour, you do what God tells you. But in order to do it with us, we are doing it for seven days for seven hours per day, not eating any food or drinking any, any liquids. However, if you have to drink liquids because you're on medicine or you just cannot go without liquids, you can do that, but don't eat any food. The moment you wake up in the morning, brush your teeth and do not eat anything else for seven hours. Do not drink anything. Do not let anything touch your lips, but the word of God. When you get hungry, you study the word. When you get hungry, you pray. When you get hungry, you seek God. Amen. 
You should fast for a specific period of time. You got to begin by refraining from solid foods. Now, a lot of us that are with SGS ministry, y'all have fasted quite a few times. So a lot of y'all don't have to start with a little bit amount of days. A lot of y'all can actually go into this fast because y'all have been prepared through other fasts that we have done. I have led you up to this fast. So you should be prepared to do seven days with no food or no water. However, those that have not, I ask you, I urge you to take precaution. Make sure that you are clear on what you're doing and make sure you refrain from the food. If it's for only four hours or three hours, do that, but commit it to God. Amen. Although Jesus Christ did not eat when he fasted, we do know with, as he was a human Amen. So we know that the body cannot withstand for 10 to 21 days without water. So we know that Jesus at some point during the 40 days of him fasting had to drink some type of liquid. Amen. Because his body as a human would not be able to withstand. Let's go to Matthew 4, chapter 2. The, I mean, Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 to 17. And we're going to talk about when Jesus fasted. Matthew 4, verses 2 to 17. But well, let's go to one. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, us as SES ministry, we just fasted for 40 days and 40 nights from six to six. Amazing. God has blessed every since. He was blessed before that, but he has blessed tremendously. It then goes on to say, the tempter came to him and said, now that the tempter is, the, the, is Satan, excuse me, that's the devil. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, when Satan was tempting Christ, he gave him back the word. He said, as it is written, I need you as your time of fasting to say, as it is written, and you read the word and you say the word out loud, that whatever I ask for, I shall receive it because of my faith. And I have forgave those that, I, that hurt me. And you can receive whatever from God. But you got to give the word back to the enemy. Amen. If Jesus Christ gave the word back, Satan knows the Bible. Satan knows the word. So you got to give the word back to him. To rebuke him. It then goes on to say in verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city. And had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God he said. Throw yourself down. For it is written. Now this is Satan speaking to Christ. He's saying for, to him. For it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift, up, lift you up in their hands. So that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord God to the test. We cannot test God. Do not use fasting as a manipulative tool to gain something from God. You cannot do that. Don't put God to a test. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. The enemy will make it look so good to you. I'm telling y'all, the enemy will make it look good. But you cannot, you cannot fall for the trap. He tried to make it look good for, for Jesus. But Jesus said, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. So, I want to talk to you a little bit about fasting. In my footnotes in my Bible, it says... This time of testing showed that Jesus really was the son of God, able to overcome the devil and his temptations. A person has not shown true obedience. Somebody say true obedience. If he or she have never had an opportunity to disobey, we can read in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse two, that God led Israel into the desert to humble and test them. God wanted to see whether or not his people would really obey him. We too will be tested because we know that testing will come. We should be alert and ready for it. Remember, your convictions are only strong if they hold up under pressure. Pressure is going to come, but that's when your convictions are strong. That's when you know if how strong you are. Amen. 
It also goes on to say the devil also called Satan tempted Eve in the garden of Eden. And here he tempted Jesus in the desert. Satan is a fallen angel. He is real, not symbolic, and is constantly fighting against those who follow and obey God. Satan temptations are real, and he is always trying to get us to live his way or our way rather than God's way. Jesus will one day reign over all creation, but Satan tried to force his hand and to get him to declare his kingship prematurely. If Jesus had given in his mission on earth to die for our sins and give us the opportunity to have eternal life would have been lost. When temptation seems especially strong or when you think you can rationalize giving in, consider whether Satan may be trying to block God's purpose is for your life or for someone else's life. Amen. This temptation by the devil shows us that Jesus was human and it gave Jesus the opportunity to reaffirm God's plan for his ministry. It also gives us an example to follow when we are tempted. Jesus temptation was an important demonstration of his sinlessness. He would face temptation and not give in. We cannot give in. Although we may feel dirty after being tempted, we should remember that temptation itself is not sin. When we give in to sin and disobey God, that's sin. Remembering this will help us turn away from the temptation. Jesus wasn't tempted, he wasn't tempted inside the temple or at his baptism, but in the desert where he was tired, alone, and hungry and was vulnerable. We won't be tempted when everything is good. We are only tempted when we are hungry, when we are going through situations, when we are alone, when we are fasting. That's when we are tempted. The devil often tempts us when we are vulnerable, when we are under physical or emotional stress. For example, loneliness, tired, weighing big decisions, or faced with uncertainty. But he always likes to tempt us through our strengths where we are most susceptible to pride. We, we must guard at all times his attacks. The devil temptations focus on three crucial areas. It focuses on our physical needs and our desires. It focuses on possessions and power. It focuses on our pride. But Jesus did not give in. Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He knows firsthand what we are experiencing and he is willing to be able to help us in our struggles. When we are tempted, turn to him for strength. Amen. Begin our fast. How do we begin our fast? We begin by repenting. Now we know that David repented. David humbled himself before God. Let's go to Psalm 69 and 10. Psalm 69 and 10. David said, when I wept and fasted, I must endure scorn. What does that mean? He said, when I wept and restrained my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. It was for him. I want you to know that fasting isn't for God. Fasting is for you to grow closer to God. It's for you to have a right relationship with God. It's for you to kill your flesh so you can get closer to God. God does not receive anything from you fasting. You receive more from God when you fast. You just receive more of him. Let's go to Psalms 35, verse 13 to 14. Psalm 35, verses 13 to 14. It says, yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. Now, if you're, if you're dealing with illness, or you know somebody that has a health problem or going through issues with their, with their body. You can fast for illness. You can fast for that. He said, when my prayers returned to me unanswered, I went about mourning as though for my friend or brother. I bowed my head in grief as though weeping for my mother. David, when he was fasting because people were ill that he was praying for, God, he felt like God did not answer his prayers, but you cannot get disturbed when you feel like God does not hear you. God hears you. You have to stay focused in your fast. Do not get, um, do not get weary. Amen. Don't go about mourning. You have to stay focused. Amen. 
And also Jeremiah, he also fasted for other people. Amen. Let's go to Jeremiah 14, 11 to 16. Jeremiah 14, 11 to 16. Jeremiah was um, speaking to um, the Israelites and he was a, 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 a prophet that was always crying and weeping and fasting for those people at that time. But the Lord said to him, he said, verse 11, Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of this people. Now they were still having idols. They were being disobedient. They didn't want to hear with Joshua as a prophet. Joshua was prophesying to them, but they did not want to hear what Joshua had to say. I mean, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, what Jeremiah had to say. And Jeremiah was prophesying to them what was going to happen. And because they didn't want to hear it, God told Jeremiah not to even pray for the well-being of those people. It says, although they fast, because they, because they always fasted, that was a ritual. I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings at the Ark of the Covenant, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. Verse 13, but I said, alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Now he said to God, God, they keep hearing other prophets saying that they won't, they won't suffer because they had done wrong, but the other prophets are saying, y'all not going to suffer. Y'all not going to suffer famine. But Jeremiah is letting them know that I'm hearing from God. I'm telling y'all, y'all are going to suffer if y'all don't focus, if y'all don't fast, if y'all don't listen to the prophecy of the Lord. He says, indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. Verse 14. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. This is what God is saying to Jeremiah for the people, that they are prophesying lies. They're lying to them that nothing's going to happen to them, but something's going to happen when you constantly fast as a ritual and not actually doing it for God and not committing yourself truly with a pure heart. It says, I have not sent them with or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own mind. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them. Yes, they are saying no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by sword and famine. And the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and sword. There will be no one to bury them, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. Wow. Let me tell y'all something. People can prophesy, prophesy to y'all all the time and say, y'all going to get this. Y'all going to receive this. Y'all going to receive house. Y'all going to receive cars. But if you are not truly fasting and praying and staying locked and loaded in this word, if you're not studying the word, if you're not staying focused in Christ, you will perish without the word in you. You do not want to perish. You do not want to constantly say, I'm a Christian. I got God knows my heart. He loves me and not study the word and not get close to God and just say, I'm a giver. God knows my heart. I always give to people. I always take care of people. Giving and taking care of people is not the, is not um, the word. We are supposed to serve God's people, but you have to study his word. You have to fast. You have to pray. You have to hear his voice. Amen. You have to be endowed and have the infilling of the Holy Spirit daily. And that comes from reading his word. So we got to stop getting so caught up in what prophets are saying to us. The prophets, they always prophesying. But God is not speaking to all these prophets that's prophesying to us. We have to be careful. Amen. It then goes on to say, begin by searching out all your sin. When you fast, you got to begin by searching out all your sin. Only you know your sin. I don't know your sin. You might call me and say, Rashida, pray for me. I'm going through this. I'm going through that. But you know your secret sins. Make sure that you are in a proper relationship with God and that there is not hidden sin in your life. What is hidden sin? That sin that you do when nobody's looking. Let's go to Psalms 19, verse 12 to 14. Psalm 19, verse 12 to 14. It says... But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden sins. Forgive my hidden faults. 
Can't nobody discern your error but you. You know your own error. It says, keep your servant also from willful sins. David was, uh, David was asked to be kept from his willful sins, that you're willing to do it. He want to be kept from that because when we're trying to sin and when we want to sin, we want to ask God to just keep us from that willful sin because we want to be able to be focused on Christ alone. Even though we'll never be sinless, but we want to be kept from that willful sin during our time of fasting. It says, may they not rule over me. A lot of our addictions and a lot of our sins, they actually rule over us. How do they rule over us? Because we can't do without them. We feel like we have to have them. And it becomes a hidden sin because now you're sneaking and you're getting high when nobody's looking and you're eating when you're not supposed to be eating and you're drinking when you're not supposed to be drinking and you're doing, you're having sex with people that you're supposed to be having sex with. You're doing things with your body and in your mind and with your thoughts. You're, you're watching pornography when nobody's watching. You're doing so many things and it's a hidden sin and only you can discern it. It says, then I will be blameless Innocent of great transgressions. After he removed that and is no longer a rule over your life for these next seven days, you will then be able to be blameless. Job was blameless. He was blameless and upright. And God blessed him. He blessed his ladder. He had double portion. He had double of everything what the enemy took from him. So we want to be blameless and upright in these next seven days. It then goes on to say in, in Psalm 19 and 14, may these words of my mouth, which you're saying out of your mouth and the meditation of my heart, it's your heart, it's a heart practice, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Y'all hear me say that every time I start my life because I want my heart to be pure. I want my meditation to be pure. I want how I study to be pure. I want that he, he could be my redeemer. He could be strong in my life. Amen. And you can say the same thing. Let the meditations of my heart be acceptable. You want it to be acceptable in his sight. When you say his words, you don't care what people think. You got to worry about what you're saying to God, to his ear. Amen. Let's go on. So some Christians become discouraged when they face their sins. A lot of us get discouraged because we know that we have a lot of sins. However, no one wants to admit that he has failed. That's why we don't admit our sins because we don't want nobody to know our sins because we fail at them. But it's okay because you have Christ. Yet the Bible teaches us in 1 John 1 to 8. Let's go to 1 John 1 to 8. I want you all to know that everybody sins. Somebody say everybody. Everybody sins. In 1 John 1 to, we're going to go from 1 John 1, 8 to 10. Everybody sins. We, some people act like they don't sin or some pastors act like they don't sin. Some ministers act like they don't sin. But we all sin. For if we claim to be without sin, if we claim to not sin, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, not John, 1 John. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Somebody say, but, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. That's for all of us. We got to confess it out of our mouth. You don't got to confess it to nobody. I tell you all that all the time. You can confess it to God in your own secret closet. Verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Why is that? Because we always in the word, we, the word stays in us so we can hide the word in our heart. So we cannot, so we might not sin against God. Why do we have to read the word daily? Because it's our daily bread. It's our daily nourishment. And if you read the word daily, it would help you every day. Because every day you're going to sin. So don't say, I don't sin. I don't do what she's doing. I don't do what he's doing. You don't do what they're doing. But you have a secret sin. Everybody does. And we're asking God to remove that sin for these next seven days to help us to get focused and not be, and be blameless in his sight. Amen. The verse, the first verse emphasizes the fact that we have a desire to sin. We all have a desire to sin. 
The second verse emphasizes the fact that we actually sin. And after God points out our sin, he provides the remedy. <laughs> Somebody say he provides the remedy. The remedy is in the word. He forgives us. He has a remedy for us. You just got to ask for forgiveness. It's in your repentance. How do you do that? How do you ask for forgiveness? The next step in fasting is to ask for cleansing from your sins. God's word promises, let's go, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. A lot of people don't want to testify. A lot of people don't want to tell nobody what God has done for them, how he has removed them from their sin. But we overcome. Somebody say we overcome. You cannot overcome your situation. It's, you already overcome it by the blood. The blood shed on the cross. Because he died on the cross, you already overcome your situation. By the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. My God. In the Old Testament, repentant sinners spent days begging God to forgive their sins. They kept going to the altar with animals and grain offerings and fellowship offerings. They kept killing doves and, and cattle and sheep. They had to keep killing animals. They killed lambs in, the, in place of their sin. They kept begging God in the Old Testament. However, we live under grace. Somebody say grace. God has promised to cleanse us when we ask his forgiveness. The basis of cleansing is not how long we pray. I want y'all to get that in your spirit. It's not how long you pray, but it is the sincerity of your prayer. The basis of cleansing is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son. Therefore, we should not be defeated or discouraged when we begin our fast. We should claim victory. Somebody say, I claim victory right now. I claim victory right now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 17. 10, 13, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. That's so clear. You have not been through nothing nobody else haven't been through. You have not been through nothing nobody else have not been through. You know you hear your parents say, this has, been, this has been done before. It, it is not nothing new. This ain't nothing new. So don't think that you're the only one dealing with that sin or that temptation. It says, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Somebody say, I can't bear it, God. But he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, Somebody say, but, because we always are going to be tempted. It says, but when you are tempted, comma, let us pause right there because I'm tempted a lot. Y'all know me. I get tempted. I tell y'all my situations. I know you get tempted. He said, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape, a way out so that you can endure it. Only you can endure it because he knows what you can handle. Everybody's temptation is not the same. So only you cannot bear that situation. Only I cannot bear a certain situation. So we have to understand that whatever you're tempted with, he will give you a way of escape for you to be able to endure it. So don't say, I couldn't get out of it. I didn't know how to not do it. Because he gave you a way of escape. Amen. Let's go on. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to 6. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to 6. It says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. You overcome the what? You overcome the world if you're born of God. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. That is amazing. Because only believers can overcome. Because we believe. It then says, 
This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water alone, but by water and blood. And it is his spirit who testifies the water because the spirit is the truth. Amen. So prayer. We have to pray continually for specific reasons. The Bible teaches us to pray constantly. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. We don't have a specific time to pray. We don't have an hour to pray. I don't tell you when to pray. God doesn't tell you when to pray. He said, pray without ceasing. During a time of fasting, set aside several periods of the day during the day when you can pray to God for specific requests. Now, a lot of us have to work. A lot of us are still quarantined. So you can take some time and say, I'm going to pray before I cook dinner. I'm going to pray before I do lunch. I'm going to pray. Whenever time is your seven times of seven hours of fasting, you can give yourself specific times to pray for what you have on your list. And you got to pray specifically for those requests. And since you are not eating, why not spend time in prayer at that time? The time that you would have been eating, pray. That you usually spend time drinking, pray. At each meal time, pray for each request on your list. We should pray in faith. Pray that you already are victorious. Pray that you already got it. Pray in advance. That thank, thank God in advance that you already received it. Let him ask in faith. Not wavering. Let's go to James chapter 1. When you pray, you got to not waver. You cannot pray and be like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I hope it happens. You got to pray and not waver. For J James chapter 1 verse 6. It says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Somebody say, but when you ask, that means you have to ask. So when you ask, you must believe. And not doubt. You got to ask, then believe, and not doubt. Amen. This means that we have the answer before it comes about. If you believe. You already know the answer. Before it comes about. Some can ask once and get their request because of their great faith. But in another sense, we should pray continually. Jesus commanded. Matthew 7 and 7. Let's go to Matthew 7 and 7. Let's see what Jesus commanded. Matthew 7 and 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Matthew 7 and 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Hallelujah. Whoever asks, you will receive. The one who seeks will find and to the one who knocks the door will be open you got to ask you got to seek in the word and you have to knock because we know god will answer our prayers we got to keep on praying we also during fasting we have to read large section of scripture when a person fasts he or she should double his daily Bible reading. Now, a lot of y'all have been following me for the last eight weeks. And we've been doing a lot of reading. We've been having a lot of homework. And I know y'all are prepared to read. We're going to read the entire book of Esther. It's ten chapters. However, I'm going to break down the, the, the chapters and verses that you're going to read each day. You're going to be able to read an entire book during these seven days. And God's going to get you through it. Because it's not a really big book. However, it's a very interesting book. You should double your reading. Perhaps you can read through an entire book of the Bible. And you should study biblical topics or the doctrine of fasting. The word of God will increase our fast. Let's go to Romans 10, 17. You can't just fast and not eat and not study the word. You can't say I'm fasting. Because if you're just fasting and not eating, that means you're on a diet. Amen. We're not on a diet. We can go work out later when they open the gym. We can go up to the, to the aid field later. But we are fasting, which means we are fasting, reading the word, and praying. Romans 10, 17. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. That's what y'all doing. Y'all listening to me. Faith comes by hearing. 
Your faith is being built up more because you've been hearing me for the last eight weeks. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. The message is only heard through the word. I preach the word and then y'all hear it and y'all receive it about Christ. I preach the gospel. I preach exactly out the scripture because I don't want to preach what, I, what I'm going through with my issues or my experiences. I want you to know the word. I don't want to prophesy to you. I want you to get clarity from what God said. Amen. And hearing comes by listening and also by hearing the word and by also reading the word for yourself. And, be, and, it, and it becomes the basis of answered prayers. Let's go to John 15 and 7. So the word will increase in your life when you listen, when you hear. And also it is the basis of answered prayers. John 15 and 7. It says, For if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. How many times do you have to remind us that if we ask, we can receive? None of y'all on here should ever say, I don't have something. I need something. I need this from God. Because if you ask, if you remain in him, how do you have continued dependence on him? How do you remain in him? You remain in him by reading his word. No other way. If you never listen to another lie from me, if you just read his word and remain in him, if you abide in him, you will be able to ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Not because of Rashida, but because what God says. Amen. Let's go to 1 John 3, 23. 1 John 3 and 23. It says, and this is his command. To believe in his the, in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. That's a command. We have to believe in his son, Jesus the Christ. We cannot receive anything by just saying, God, I need this. God, I need that. You have to say, God, I need this in Jesus' name. Because Jesus goes to God on our behalf. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. He is our buffer. He goes before us. So because of his bloodshed, the blood is on us. And God don't see our sin because we're covered by the blood. And because we're covered by the blood, our sin is covered. So Jesus Christ, because we believe in Jesus Christ, he goes to God on our behalf. Amen. So we have to select key verses also to memorize during our fast. A person should memorize verses that become the basis for his prayers. Perhaps the basis or the verses he memorizes will become a stimulus for more faith and trust in God for the answers he seeks. Remember, try to remember one memory verse. I remember, I love Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord. And the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I always love that scripture because I was having some bad days at some times. And I'm like, I will bless the Lord at all times. It, no matter whether it's good, bad, and different. And I needed to remind myself that when it's bad, I still need him. Amen. So rem try to remember one verse during this fast. Amen. So we have to fast and worship God. The very abstinence from food could show one's dedication to God. Just the very abstinence of food. You showing your dedication. If a person's heart attitude is right when he fasts, he is worshiping God. Anna served God through her prayers and fasting. Let's go to Luke 2. In 37, Luke 2 and 37. Now, Anna was a prophet. Anna was a prophet. Verse, I'm going to start at verse 36. And Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to 37. It says, there was also a prophet named Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then was a widow until she was 84 years old. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Now, I know some of y'all saying, I'm too old to fast. I need to take my medicine. I got to, I don't know, she did. This is, might be hard. No food, no, no water, no juice for seven hours. But if Anna, at 84 years old, because she was worshiping God, you got to worship with your heart. You got to worship with your mind. You got to say to yourself, God, I want more from you. What do I need to do? You got to worship him. You got to seek him. You got to get before him in your presence and get on your knees 
and ask God to take away the desire of food for these seven hours. I don't want to be so hungry that I can't complete this fast. Because if an 84-year-old woman can do it, you can too. We worship and magnify him. One of the best ways to magnify God is to contemplate his greatness and his power. Just the consideration of God and his attributes is an act of worship. What Another way to worship God is to thank him for all he has done for you. Try to review your life and recount all the answers to prayers that you have received. You got to thank him for his prayers in advance, amen? Or when, when things are happening, you got to start thanking him. Put a check mark by it. I got check marks by so many prayers that I had during this COVID season. And I'm so excited to see the check marks because I'm like, oh my God, you really are moving. Then recall the times you experienced the protection or guidance of God. A lot of times we won't just get things from God, but he can protect you from an accident. He protect your child from getting hurt. He protect your household from catching fire. All things, a lot of things we are protected from, our children are protected from. You can thank God for that and worship him just for that. Amen. It says, when you realize what God has done in the past, you will have confidence to take every petition to him. You know how we, we sign a petition? We're now petitioning God on our behalf. Amen. Let's go to Matthew 6. 16 to 18. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. It says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. That means don't be like, oh my God, I'm fasting. I'm so hungry. I'm fasting, y'all. Don't tell everybody you fasting. Don't look all somber, dried out. Anoint yourself. It says, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. When you boast about your fasting, when you feel like you got to tell everybody, you now are receiving your reward in full. What you ask of a guy, you won't even receive it. He going to give it to you right away like, all right, you got your reward. Because you want to tell everybody, you want to be boastful. You want to be seen by men. He says, but when you fast, somebody say, but. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Anointed oil. We're going to consecrate our oil today. This is just regular extra virgin olive oil from the market. It's not special. It becomes special when you consecrate it. Amen. It says, so that it will be not obvious to others that you are fasting. We don't want to be obvious. But to only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you it's when you fast in secret now everybody on facebook knows that sgs ministry is fasting may 24th to may 31st but they don't know the individuals that are fasting so do not post on your facebook page today is day one of my fast today is day two of my fast today is day three i barely can make it pray for me y'all do not do that it is not for show you will, re you will receive your reward immediately. But if you want your prayers answered, you will do it in secret. I don't want to see no prayer signs on your, fa on your page saying, pray for me, SGS is fasting. I do not. It is not for show. We are seeking God as a corporate fast. Amen. We want our reward in heaven. We want our re reward on earth. But what we bind on earth and bind in heaven, what we lose on earth and lose in heaven, how we fast on earth, we will receive that, that our, our reward from God now. Amen? Amen. Let's go on. I want to tell you the Hebrew word for fasting. It means to cover the mouth. That's what the Hebrew word means. That means cover the mouth. That means do not let anything go in your mouth for seven hours. That's the Hebrew word. The Greek word for fasting is to abstain. That means to not do it. Abstain. So if we're abstaining and covering our mouths, we are going to be hungry. But you have to eat the word when you're hungry. Amen? Because you want God to do it for you. You want God to bless you on his behalf, but it's through your abstaining. In the early ages, men ate sporadically according to the production of the earth and the successes of the hunt. 
Now, we know that we can go to the store right now and get a bag of chips. We can go to the store and get a soda. We have food everywhere. The feeding of 4,000, we giving out food every day, every week. So we have food in an abundance. But I'm telling you that in those times, they didn't have a lot. So they were already used to not eating all the time. So their body was used to withstanding from food. Thus, fasting was often compulsory and looked on as the will of the gods. Gods with a little g. So they would fast for their idols, for their gods. And men in almost every culture came to believe that willing abstinence from the food would please their gods. You can't please your idols. You can't please people. You can't please things. You have to know why you're fasting. It then goes on to say the Jews were commanded by God to fast. This illustrated their submission to his will. It's a difference. It's a very, it's a big difference to abstain for your, for your own good, but it's, it's a difference to abstain to receive from God. The word fasting is not found in the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. You will not find the word fasting in the Pentateuch. But often it, refer, it occurs in the historical books and the prophets. In the law, we find instead the expression humble or afflict your soul. Now that's what they meant by fasting. We just read it in Isaiah that he was saying to afflict your soul. That's what they meant by fasting. Implying the sacrifice of personal will. This gives to fasting all of its values. You got to afflict your soul. That's why you will hear the voice of the Lord even more clear when you're fasting. Why? Because you're afflicting your soul. You're, you're killing the flesh. You're denying the flesh. So when you deny the flesh, the spirit rises. Amen. And when it rises, you will hear the voice of the Lord. The Jews abstain from all food during a single day of fasting, evening to evening, but might abstain only from certain types of food during a prolonged personal fast. Now, I told you that they fasted for a whole day. From, they usually fast from evening to evening, and that's during their um, Sabbath. That's during their Sabbath. Amen. That's from usually their, their Friday to their Saturday and then for their worship. In, in manifesting their repentance, it was not unusual for them to put on sackcloth, rend the garments, and scatter ashes over their head. They will also fast for the Day of Atonement. The Mosaic Law prescribed only one public occasion of strict fasting each year, and that was on the Great Day of Atonement. That's out of the book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 9. Amen? However, the Jews were in the habit of fasting spontaneously on other occasions as well. Whenever they were in hard and trying circumstances, misfortune and bereavement, they would fast. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. At this time... Hannah was fasting. Hannah was, had a husband named Elkinah. And he had a second wife named Penina. Penina was able to have children. Hannah was barren. She was unable to produce children. Hannah fasted. This is what happened. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. But Hannah... Oh, I'm going to start from verse 3. Year after year, Elkinah went up from his town to worship... And sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophani and Phinehas, 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 forget it, Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Echina to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. I don't know who can't have children on this live tonight, but if you are praying for your womb to be open, God bless Hannah. He will do the same for you. It says verse six, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, which was Penina, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. 
Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. She would not eat while she was at the altar. She was fasting every time she would go to make sacrifice, whenever she went to go pray. Her husband, Elkina, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now I, Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Afterwards, Hannah was then given more. She was then got, she got pregnant later on. I want y'all to know that God will touch your womb if you fast and pray. Because God does the best. He barons. Sometimes he puts people in situations of barrenness. But he will open it up if you weep and you fast. Amen. It's a promise. He promised her. He gave her many sons. Let's go on. Whenever they face prospect of threatened judgment of God, they fasted. Let's go to 2 Samuel 12, 15 and 16. 2 Samuel 12, 15. Let's go to 12, let's go to 12, 15 and 17. 2 Samuel, it says, You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight because before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Now, this was David. He was fasting because he had killed Uriah, which was his wife's husband. He took his wife, which was Bathsheba, from her husband and got him killed on the front line of war. And his wife got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, God wound up killing her baby because of the sin of David. But David actually began to fast and, his, and, be, and Nathan told him he will, not, he will take away your sin because of your fasting. However, your child has to die in place of it. My God, a lot of our kids are dying because of our sin. We say, why are my kids getting shot in the street? Why is this happening to my child? Well, a lot of it is because of our sin. And we have not asked God to forgive us or we have not repented. And a lot of that sin is falling on our children. It then goes on to say, after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, which is Bathsheba, and, had, and had, he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of the household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. Let's go on. <clears throat> it then goes on to say, David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves and he realized the child was dead. That's verse 19. He said, is the child dead? They say, yes, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Now he fasted, hoping that God would save his child and remove the sin from him. God still killed his son, but David still worshiped God, even though he killed his son. We got to still worship God, even when it looks bad. Even when we're not, get, we're not going to get the answer that we want from God, we still have to worship him. He said he went into his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you, and you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. I thought... Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to be, he may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So don't get stuck in constantly fasting and fasting and fasting for something when God already showed you the answer. It's done. Now it's time to worship and move forward. David got up 
and moved on. Let's go on. The Jews fasted whenever they had fallen into grievous sin. Let's go to Ezra chapter 10, verse 6. Ezra chapter 10, verse 6. I'm going I'm to I'm read from chapter 10, verse 1 to 6. It then goes on to say, chapter 10, verse 1. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, children gather around him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shekinah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, Why have been, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us? But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children. In accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God, let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you. So take courage and do it. So Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested. And they took the oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jeho Jehonian, son of Elias. While he was there, he ate no food and drank no water. Somebody say he ate no food and drank no water because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the is exiles, exiles. So he was fasting for the exiles, for them being unfaithful to God. Sometimes you can pray for others in your fasting. Amen. Let's go on. Whenever the Jews wish to avert heavy calamity, they would fast. Let's go to Esther chapter four, verse one to three. Esther chapter four, verse one to three. And I can't find Esther. Esther chapter 4. So I'm going to read Esther chapter 4 verse 1 to 16. Because it's, it's so good. And I want you to know how Esther blessed so many through her fasting. It says, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloths, and went out in the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. There was a great mourning. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuch and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hector, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hector went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for the annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show Esther and to explain to her. And he told her to instruct her to go to the king's presence, to beg for mercy and plead with him for her, for her people. Hathic went back and reported to Esther with Mordecai, he said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the kings, I'm in verse 11, all the king's officials and all the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has put has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Now, Esther knew that she could not, even though she was the queen, she could not just go to the king and ask for anything. She had to be given the golden scepter and it had to be done every 30 days. She was able to be going. She was able to go to the king. 
So she knew the law. So because of that, she was trying to see what can she do. It says in verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your, and your father's family will perish. And you know, who knows, but that you, have been, that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I die, I die. That's how serious we got to be about fasting. You got to say, if I die, I die. But I got to get to the Lord. If I perish, let me perish. That's how Esther was. She was so sincere about freeing the Jews. We can free our own city. We can free our own nation. We can free our family. If we have that much power in our belief, if we have that much faith, let's go on. It says other fasts were eventually instituted in memory of the capture of Jerusalem, the burning of the temple, etc. By the time of Jesus, the Pharisees fasted on the second and fifth day of every week. Now they did it as a ritual. The second and fifth day of every week, the Pharisees fasted, but it was just an ordinary pious exercise. This is not ordinary for us. We don't want to just do it just to be doing it. We're doing it because we need something from God. Amen. The prophets Isaiah and Jesus, Matthew 6 and Isaiah 58. Now we read both of them. Certainly shows us that fasting was very much abused. They, uh, the Israelites and the Pharisees abused fasting. Let's go to 2 um, Corinthians 11 and 27. Paul talks about how they abused it. 2 Corinthians verse 11 to 17. I'm sorry, 11 to 27. I'm sorry, y'all. 1 Corinthians 11 to 20. 2 Corinthians 11 to 27. My God. It says, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. Now he's saying, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, I have fasted many times. I know what it is to be hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. So he's letting them know. He's, Paul is saying that I have did all these things, but it has to be done to the glory of God. Amen. It can't be for rituals a ritualistic uh, act. It has to be done unto God. Fasting, it is negative for the flesh. Because the flesh don't want us to fast. The flesh wants to be eat, wants food. But it's positive for the spirit. Amen. What is, what is food for? Food is for our enjoyment. We know that food is for our enjoyment. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 24 to 25. I'm not going to go through all these scriptures because I'm running out of time. But God also gave us food for sustenance. Out of Genesis chapter 1 verse 30. He then gave us food for fellowship. So we know that food is necessary. He gave us food for fellowship out of Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 to 8. I want you all to know that biblical fasting is not a manipulative tool. Let's go to Jeremiah 14 and 12. Do not use fasting as a manipulative tool. It says, although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain, grain offerings, I will not accept them. They, they're being manipulative. Do not be manipulative. We already read that scripture. But I want you to know you cannot be manipulative. Let's go to Acts 23, 12, and 14. Acts 23, 12 to 14. It says, The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Now, they was fasting to find a time to kill Paul. How can you fast to kill somebody? 
They was using fasting as a manipulative tool. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Don't use it as a manipulative tool. Amen. Biblical fasting is not a hypocritical religious exercise. Let's go to Luke 18 and 12. Luke 18, 12. Luke 18, 12 and A. No, 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 no. Forget that. Forget, for, forget that. Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? I can't find it. Don't forget it. Let's go to 1 Samuel 30, um, 31 and 13. They fasted um, when you mourning someone's death. Let's go to 1 Samuel 31 and 13. 1 Samuel 31 and 31 to 13. First Samuel 31, 13. I'm trying to hurry up because we're running out of time. It says, then they took their bones and buried them under a timorous tree at Jabez. And they fasted seven days. They were fasting because they were mourning somebody's death. Now, you can fast if you're mourning somebody's death. Sometimes you have great mourning and you don't know how to get, your, get a close relationship with God. You don't know how to get to be centered back into hearing Christ's voice. But you can fast for mourning someone's death. Let's go to mourning sin. When we're mourning sin, for example, in repentance and confession. Let's go to Deuteronomy 9 and 18. Deuteronomy 9, 18. It says, then once I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. This is Moses speaking. I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had conferred, you have, you have committed. Doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so arousing his anger. Now we know that Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. He had no food or no drink. Amen. So he was actually fasting for their sin. He was mourning their sin. Let's go to um, Jeremiah 36 because you can fast for impending danger or for protection. Jeremiah 36, 4 to 7. Now, we just read a little bit of Jeremiah already, but I want you to also see here where they also fasted in 36, 4 to 7. It says, so Jeremiah son, called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the, the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote down on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I am restricted. I am not allowed to go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll the words of the Lord that you wrote as I, as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in front of the towns. Now he was doing that for their protection. Amen. He said, I can't go, but you can go, but go on the day of fasting. Then you can also fast for sickness. Let's go to 2 Samuel 12, 15 and, 12, 15 and 17. We already read that, I believe. Yeah, we already read that. So you can pray, you can do um pray for fasting with for sickness. Let's go to um that you can pray for direction. Let's go to 2 Chronicle. 2 Chronicle 20 and 3. 2 Chronicle chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. You can pray for direction. Sometimes we need direction for our jobs, for our lives. And it says, 20 verse 1 to 3. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Menunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming up against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already... In Hazan, Tamar, that is in Gedi, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. 
So because he wanted direction for what he was supposed to do in the war, he, he, he proclaimed a fast. Amen. So if you need direction, you can fast. Amen. Also, people fast for the ordination of minister, ministries, missionaries, or church leaders. Let's go to Acts chapter 13, verse 2 to 3. Acts 13, verse 2 to 3. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to have to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. When you start a ministry or you start a church or leaders, they always fast first. You are to fast and then you are anoint yourself with oil and then the the. People that are over you, the elders will then lay hands on you and then send you to go forth in your ministry. Amen. Then you will also be able to fast for special revelation as Daniel did. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 verse 7. So Daniel, Daniel had fasted. He fasted twice, two different times. He fasted for 10 days and then he fasted for 21 days. I'm going to read both. Daniel 9, 17 to 18, it says, Now our God hears the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your God, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give your ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Let's go to Daniel 1. Daniel 1 and 5. I mean, Daniel 1 and 11. It says, Daniel then said to the, to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your service for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat. And water to drink. That's the Daniel fast. That's just vegetables and water. Then command our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and test your and treat your service in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Let's go to Daniel 10, 1 to 3. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks for 21 days. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until three weeks were over. He fasted for how many days? 21 days and 10 days. So, that's the Daniel fast. There also is different types of fasting. There's the absolute fast or the complete fast, which is, is it's a fast that is refra refraining from both food and liquid for an extended period of time. It may include also mutual fasting from sex and marriage. So we are doing an absolute complete fast for seven hours for seven days. Then there is also a full fast, which is going without food for a definite period of time in which you drink water or juice. So you can do a full fast as well where you drink juice or water during your seven hours if you are unable to refrain from food and water. Then there is a partial or a Daniel fast which is consisting of just fruits and vegetables and water. I'm not, I'm not letting you do the fruits and vegetables and water unless you never fasted with SGS ministry. If you never fasted with us do the Daniel fast for them seven days for seven hours. Just eat fruits and vegetables. Not no vegetable chips. Not no veggie chips. Not no fruit snacks. That's not fruit. Fruit is from the earth. Amen? Then there also is a media fast, which means to take a break from television, CD music, radio, newspaper, magazines, from the internet, from Facebook, from Instagram. You could do a media fast. What does a fast consist of? What is the benefits of fasting? The benefits of fasting is that it, it increases our faith. It has demonic power. It's broken. Our fasting brings unity. 
Fasting destroys strife. God reveals things to us during fasting. God breaks spiritual warfare. He breaks addictions. He takes dominion over the flesh. Fasting makes us focus on the word of God with prayer. Fasting makes us become more prayerful. And victory comes after fasting. Somebody say victory comes after fasting. Fasting is an expression of wholeheartedness. Acts chapter 13 and 2. We already read that. But men of God fasted and they carried out the command of the Lord. Acts chapter 9 verses 9 to 17. Paul fasted also for three days after his conversion. When Paul's name was Saul, which we're learning in Bible study. And then he was changed. His conversion was to Paul. His name was changed. He fasted for three days. He was blind. He ate nothing for three days. Then victory came. Then he wrote half of the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. In fasting often, Paul recommends periods of fasting and prayer. 1 Corinthians 7 and 5. Paul shows that we should fast with periods of fasting. I want to tell y'all, God honors any sacrifice we make for him. And he does not set down rigid rules of contacting him. You can contact God anytime. If you don't fast, you can still contact God. Don't fast just for the sake of fasting. But fast out of obedience as a member and for the purpose of contacting God about a definite concern concern. In this fast, going into this next season, amen, your fast always should edify you and glorify God. I talked about that. Our fast does not edify God. It edifies us. It edifies our body and it glorifies God. Use the wisdom God has given you and whatever you get, what God has for you while you're on this fast. So moreover, when you fast, be not like the hypocrites. Do not do it in front of people or not do it in front of man. Amen. We will be studying the book of Esther from chapter 1 to chapter 10. We will also read a portion of scripture from Psalms chapter 34 all the way to the end of Psalms every day. From Psalms 31, th 34 chapter um, 34 verses 1 to 22. I will... Definitely put all the scriptures up and all of the, the days that you are supposed to read particular parts of scripture. Now, I want you to go get your oil. If you don't have it with you, you can consecrate your oil later. But at this time, because we are now at 934, I am going to consecrate our oil. I'm going to pray for you guys. And I'm expecting to hear from you on Sunday and Knowing that you're going to fast, you're going to anoint yourself in the morning when you wake up for our live on Sunday morning. You're going to anoint your body. Wherever you're having pain, you're going to anoint your house. You're going to make sure you anoint your mouth, anoint your pocketbook, anoint anything that you want change in. Amen. So we're going to consecrate our oil. Most gracious and eternal Father, we bless your name. Father, we come humbly to the throne of grace. You said come boldly to the throne. We come in boldly, God. You have taught us about fasting. You have opened our ears of understanding. You have opened our knowledge of understanding. Father, you also taught us about the oil back in the time when we learned about it during Easter time. But Father, I ask you today to take our oil, consecrate it, God. Father, allow the anointing to come from the power from the Holy Ghost, God. Father, let this oil be different than it was when we bought it from the store. That when we touch anything with it, that the manifestation from you will happen. That the power will show up. That you will be in the oil. Father, the oil is necessary. Father, you gave the oil. You put the oil on Aaron's head and it ran down his beard to the bottom of his, um, by, by, to the bottom of his cloth, God. Father, so we ask you in the name of Jesus to anoint us afresh. Give us new oil for the journey. God, consecrate us. Purify us. Sanctify us. We want to be different than we was before. We don't want to be like last week. We don't want to be like yesterday. We don't want to be like last year. We don't want to be like last month. We want a difference. We want to change. We want people to see difference in us. We want to be brand new, creating us a clean heart and renewing us a right spirit. Father, we ask, we ask today to forgive us for our sins, recognizing that we fall short of the glory every single day. But we know now that you have given us the remedy that you do not give us temptation beyond which we can bear. 
So, Father, we thank you for the understanding. We thank you so much, God, for these words. We thank you so much for your, for your spirit. We thank you so much for the Bible, God. We thank you so much that you have given us direction, God. You have given us instruction for living. So, Father, we bless your name. We honor you, and we thank you so much for this time of fasting. God, we ask you to bless all the prayer requests. We ask you to cover everybody in this time of fasting. Father, see their heart. I ask you, God, to see their heart. The power that's in me, God, I ask you to transfer it over to them. Let the Holy Ghost meet them at their house, God. Let the Holy Ghost touch their life, God. Let them feel your presence, God. Let them hear your voice, God. You say, my sheep hear my voice. So, Father, we are your sheep. We want to hear you, God. We need you like never before, God. Do something in us today. Father, as we ask for you to clean our hearts on this Friday and Saturday, to prepare us for Saturday, God, prepare us for Sunday, I ask you to cleanse us, purify us, consecrate us, and saturate us with your blood. Father, I ask you to let the blood cover our houses. Let the blood cover our, our children. Let the blood cover our relationships. Let the blood cover our spouses. Let the blood cover our bodies. Let the blood cover the areas that is broken. Let the blood cover our, our areas that, that hurt. The, the, the places that we are in pain. The areas that we are yoked with bondage. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to let the blood do the work. So we need you, God, in this hour. We don't want to come out of this quarantine the same. We don't want to come out of this quarantine not change. We want people to see a difference on our lives. We want them to know that we have been with Jesus. So, Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for decreasing Rashida and increasing you. Thank you for using sisters growing strong. No woman left behind. Thank you for letting me be a vessel for your people. Continue to use me till you use me up. Now may the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth and forevermore. Let the children of the living God say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 If you don't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins... And you need to know him. You want to know him. You want to get better in your faith. You want to get closer to God. I just say to you that faith comes by hearing the message. And the message is heard through Jesus Christ's word. And if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I love y'all. Thank y'all for staying on this live. If you know anybody that want to do the fast, tell them to check out the, the YouTube video. It will be up tomorrow morning. And I thank God that the video did not stop. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank y'all for praying for the video. Thank y'all for praying for the live. If you know anybody that needs help in fasting, if you know anybody that needs a breakthrough, if you know anybody that needs to be delivered, if you know anybody that needs healing, you tell them it's imperative that they fast with SGS ministry before we leave this quarantine. Amen. I love you. God bless you. And may heaven smile upon you. I'll see you guys on Sunday. Amen.